Um, looks like we're a little bit down tonight, which is understandable because of the state of things. Um, be sure that you are, when you see people, just, just tell them, hey, it's, it's cool to miss a Wednesday and come on back. All right, we'll always have a little bit of review. Uh, we'll always try to catch folks up. Um, and, um, and staying up with your, with your reading is, is going to be really uh, important, maybe even more so than, than this little conversation that we're having together. Um, I do want to uh, just echo something of what Scott just said, you know, as we are beginning the, 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 um, the process of, it feels like we're regathering again. Um, just encourage people uh, that, um, that we are meeting in a space that is large enough to, to space ourselves out. We are fumigating this building. Uh, we are cleaning daily the children's areas. Um, we, we're doing everything that we can do to provide a safe atmosphere for you. And so if folks are you, are, 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 are you, Feeling safe enough to go to Walmart and grab a buggy uh, or do those kinds of things, then they should feel safe enough to come and, and gather here for worship. And so just encourage folks kindly uh, with that um, because we need to begin to show uh, that, that the gathering of God's church is, is important to us. And, um, and so I certainly understand and, and relate to uh, the concerns that some folks have, and I want to honor that. Uh, but at the same time, if it is your custom to be out and about during the week and shopping and doing those kinds of things, then you should feel safe to come and worship with God's people here at Brookwood. Amen? Amen. Okay, so uh, just help us out with that. So tonight we are in uh, chapter five of the story, okay? Now remember, um, this, is, uh, not the, uh, this is not the Bible uh, word for word. It is, um, it is a, a, not, not a summary because it is the NIV translation of scripture, um, but it is a, a selection of scripture uh, to help us as we kind of walk along. And so it will, by the time we get done with this in December, which will be done in December, um, you will have read through the Bible essentially in a year. And, uh, and so maybe some of you have done that before, that's your practice, and this is helping you do that again. Maybe some of you, it's your very first time to do that kind of a thing. And so the commitment that you made way back in January um, is an important one because you're not just committing to this gathering. You're saying, I'm going to commit myself to read through Scripture uh, in the next 12 months. And God's going to bless you for that, I assure you. He's going to bless you on that journey. Um, I've told you that uh, I always want you to um, have uh, some resources uh, to, to help you along the way. This is a little bit different resource than I've given you uh, over the last several weeks. Uh, this is a podcast called Capital Conversations. Um, it, is a, um, it is the staff of, uh, of our Southern Baptist Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, and, um, and they work in Washington, D.C., with a legislative agenda, and uh, as you would understand, it is, it is mainly centered around the sanctity of human life and uh, biblical immigration policies, um, freedom of religion, uh, those kinds of things are what their agenda, but they have really great uh, conversations on this podcast, and this is a podcast. They have really great conversations. If you're interested in international affairs and how, how, how does a believer see those kinds of things, what, what should we be thinking about, our relationship with China and things like that, they have those conversations. Sometimes I feel left out as a Christian when it comes to those kinds of conversations. And, um, and, and, and they do a great job of building my understanding of, of what's happening. And uh, the most recent um, Capital Conversations was on, you know, what, what's next in the fight uh, to protect life. And uh, it was really a great panel discussion. And uh, I was excited about uh, the things that are happening. And I was distressed about a new administration's lack of commitment to uh, the protection of human life. And so I am uh, lots to pray about, but lots to be hopeful for. So it's really, really good. I just want to encourage you to, um, if you look at, at those kinds of things, uh, if you're a podcast listener, that you, um, that you do that, that you check that out. Okay, uh, Scott's already prayed for us. Let's kind of do a little review right quick. And we do have some, I do have a couple of questions. And if you've got uh, a question, you can go grab a card and uh, fill it out for us. 
and we'll, we'll try to, our best to answer it. <clears throat> um, remember, our, our kind of our, my overarching statement for our study together is uh, this statement, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things, right? And so a lot of the things that we have conversations about, they are disputable matters. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of things that Christians have argued over over the years and divided up into camps over the years, um, they are disputable matters. And we need to be sure that we are focusing on the main things. And we can always be confident that the main things will be plain things, right? And those plain things we can be confident are the the main things. And so, so just know that. And um, that, that is a, that's an important um, statement. Again, Alistair Begg uh, says that. It's one of his things. And uh, I like it a lot. And we're studying the Bible as one big story, right? And the Bible is one big story about who? A great big God, right? It is one big story about a great big God. And so Genesis connects us to Revelation uh, and all in between there is, some of y'all, have y'all heard, y'all remember the, the, um, the, the y'all remember hearing the phrase, some of y'all have been in church a long time, uh, the scarlet thread of redemption. Y'all remember, y'all, y'all, y'all heard that. I can't remember, there's some study Bible, maybe like the Ryrie study Bible or something like that that, that really focuses on that. Um, but that scarlet thread of redemption is, the, is the, what we talked about, about the seed of the woman that would overcome the seed of the serpent and the, the skins that God provided to cover the shame of Adam and Eve and the ark that delivered Noah and his family from the wrath of God against sin. Those kinds of things, that scarlet thread of redemption. And so that's what we're looking for as we study God's word, and, um, and it is, the Bible is one big story about a great big God. Now, we are in Exodus now, but let's do a quick review um, about some names right quick. There are, I am supposed to be forwarding this through, sorry about that. Joey, why don't you throw something at me up there? All right, so main things are plain things, plain things are main things. Next one is, one about, the Bible's one big story about a great big God. Now, name the patriarchs. There are Three patriarchs that even God identifies himself. I am the God of your fathers. And then he gives us three names, all right? So how many of you know what those three names are? Right, turn to your neighbor and tell them the names of the three patriarchs. Turn to your neighbor, see if you can get it. Larry, Moe, and Curly. Not it? Did you get it? Abraham, Isaac, and... Right, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so these are the men through whom God worked um, according to his choosing uh, so that he might accomplish his purposes in the world, which is his passion for his glory among all peoples, right? That is God's purpose in the world, his passion for his glory among all peoples. And so that begins with Abraham and Sarah and a son of, <clears throat> of blessing, and that son's name is Isaac. Isaac has twins. Isaac and Rebecca have twin boys. What are those twin boys' names? Esau and, right. Jacob has how many sons? Twelve sons. Those twelve sons become the heads of the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay? Those twelve sons become the heads of the twelve tribes of Israel. One of those sons of Jacob's, the next to youngest son, the oldest son of uh, Rachel, um, and remember, remember that uh, Jacob had like two wives and two concubines, and we learned when we talk about those kinds of things, is that prescriptive or descriptive? It is descriptive, right? It is not, the Bible's not telling us something to do when it describes multiple marriages and concubines and things like that. It's, it, honestly, whenever you read those stories, it's a train wreck every time, all right? So just because the Bible describes something, it doesn't mean it's prescribing something. That's a very important thing to remember because a lot of folks will throw those kinds of crazy things in your face and say, you believe in that kind of a Bible? <laughs> and you just, just say, yeah, I believe that God works through broken people just like me, just like you, okay? There are some things that are descriptive. There are some things that are prescriptive. And the things that are prescriptive will always be plain things, right? Not things like crazy multiple wives and stuff like that. All right, so where am I? So Jacob has a son, uh, Rachel, the wife of, that he preferred, uh, her oldest son. Um, and he's often described as the one whom the Lord was with, all right? 
He ends up saving the family from starvation. What's his name? Joseph, that's exactly right. And so when you think about Genesis, you can think about Genesis as four major events and four major people, all right? The four major events happen between Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter 11. The four major events, you can probably say them with me, creation, the fall, a flood, and a tower, right? So those are the four major events. Lena, you remember this from Dr. Utley's class. Four major events, right? That's Genesis 1 through 11. Genesis 12 through 50 are four major people. And they are, we just talked about them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That's exactly right. And so, uh, again, those things help me remember things. And so, um, four major events, four major people in the book of Genesis. Now, we've talked together, especially in the story of Joseph, that in every story, there is, an, there is a lower story and an upper story happening simultaneously, right? What is the lower story? When we say the lower story, like in Joseph's story, what are we talking about? What was, his lower, what was the lower story of Joseph? Right coat of many colors, all those things. I'm still not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. That's okay. Um, there we go. Uh, so I need to hold this in my hand. All right. So we've got uh, the coat of many colors. It's the, the, the brother selling him into slavery, right? It is Potiphar's wife accusing him of, uh, of, of sexual assault. It is, uh, it is him being forgotten in a prison for two years. It is, it is his rise to, uh, to leadership as a second in command in Egypt. That's the lower story, right? Well, what's, what's the upper story? It was Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, right? What man meant for harm, God meant for good, right? For the deliverance of many people. And so both those things are happening at the same time. And we talk about how in our lives of up and down, we don't need to get lost in the up and down. We need to remember that God is accomplishing an upper story while we are experiencing on a daily basis our lower story. Um, in the story of, uh, of Moses that follows in the first few chapters of Exodus that we talked about last Wednesday, chapter four, and deliverance, we learn three very important things from the story of Moses, and they are God's name. And what did we, that's in Exodus chapter three, right? What's, what is God's name? Moses says, who shall I say is sending me? And what does God say? I am, right? And what, what does that turn into for us? It's the name Yahweh, right, or Yahweh. Uh, and we add some vowels in there that Hebrew people don't use, but, but um, we say Yahweh, it, and that's what I am sounds like, Yahweh. I am that I am, right? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is I am. He is unchanging. So we learn about God's name. We learn about God's power, right? What does God say? I'm sending you to Pharaoh, and I'm going to put on display my power, right? Now, did you notice when you were reading last week's selection that uh, over and over again, Moses tells us that Pharaoh's heart was hardened? Just see, that would be, I, I just spent um, maybe Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday afternoon or one, one day while I was in jail la that week, um, I did a little, a little study on the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And it was really, really good to kind of walk through that and see how Paul ties that together. Romans chapter 9 and verse 16, Paul talks about God hardening the heart of Pharaoh. And uh, so listing out all the times that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, when Pharaoh, or Pharaoh hardened his heart, um, all of that. But all that happened so that God might display his power. And ultimately, that God might accomplish his purpose, right? And what was his purpose when he, when he told Abraham or Abram at the time that he was calling him to be a uh, the father of many nations. What did he tell him? I'm going to give you a special land, right? The land of the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites. I'm going to give you this land. He does the same thing. That's in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. He tells um, Isaac in Genesis 26 and then Jacob in Genesis 28 and 35. He tells all three of them, I'm going to make you into a great nation. But in 
Moses' experience, they don't end up in the land of the Canaanites, the Jebusites, and the Perizzites, and the Termites, right? They end up in where? Egypt. So God's got to accomplish his purpose ultimately, and so now he's got to get them out of Egypt. And that's what the story from last week was all about, the deliverance of God's people. Ultimately, God delivers, and here's a map, um, or maybe not, nope, not a map yet. So ultimately, God delivered his children through what? Right, the 10th plague against the firstborn of every Egyptian home. The children of Israel are not immune to that plague unless they do what? They take a blood of a lamb and cover the doorposts of their home with the blood of an unblemished lamb. We know that we are told by John, in John chapter one, verse 36, that Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin, not foe, but of the world, okay? The sin of the world. Now, there are moments in, uh, in, the, in the upper and lower story when, uh, when, they, when they meet together, all right? When the upper and lower story just come together and they're, and they're not just happening simultaneously, but they're happening, it's, it's evident that the upper and lower story, this is it, right? And, and, and uh, one, one sermon that I read said, said that that happens really five times in, in the Bible. Five times. Creation, Mount Sinai, the incarnation of Jesus, Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes down on the church. And then at the end, right? Rider on a white horse, riding victoriously ushering in a new heaven and a new earth. And so we, we have um, what that pastor says is the down here moment. A lot of times we think about God and we think about God as being up there, right? But there are times when God makes himself known in the down here way, when he comes to be with us. That's exactly what's happening in the Garden of Eden. God is with Adam and Eve. That's exactly what happens at Mount Sinai. God comes down. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? If you think about, I'm so excited about, uh, on February the 14th, we're going to start a sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. And the, the correlation of Mount Sinai and the Sermon on the Mount is just, it's unmistakable, the pattern that is happening there. Because at Mount Sinai, God comes down to give this people uh, structure and guidance and, and, and life. And in the Sermon on the Mount, God is in the flesh with us, giving a new way to live our lives. I mean, it's just like, woo! How about that? They're like the same thing happening, you know? And, um, and so, really, really good stuff. I'm really excited about that sermon series that we will start together on February the 14th. All right, so now let's talk about part five. Chapter five, uh, new commandments and a new covenant. And so we read uh, Exodus chapter 19 through Exodus chapter 40 with a, a little illusion, a summary at the end of the book of Leviticus. And so that's kind of what we're talking, that's not, that's what we're talking about tonight. Um, I, um, I read about uh, a, a little funny about a, a thief that was uh, trying to rob a house. And so he's sneaking around in the dark and while he's doing his thievery thing, uh, he hears uh, somebody say, Jesus is watching. So he kind of looks around, doesn't see anybody, thinks maybe he's hearing something. So he keeps on doing his thievery, and uh, then he hears again, Jesus is watching. And so he flicks on enough light to see what's going on, and it's a parrot saying, Jesus is watching. And he asks the parrot, he says, what's your name? The parrot says, Moses. <laughs> and he says, what kind of family names their parrot Moses? And the parrot says, same kind of family that would name their pit bull Jesus. So Moses and Jesus are working together there. And in the same way, in Scripture, Moses and Jesus are, they are 
Moses is a pattern of Jesus, right? Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of a prophet like Moses. We talked about the pattern that repeats itself on Sinai, repeats itself on, on the Sermon on the Mount. And so, so we've got that, that's what's happening here. Now, when, when Israel leaves Egypt, this is in uh, Exodus chapter 12, when Israel leaves Egypt, how long have they been there? Anybody know that? 430 years to the day. That's what Exodus chapter 12, verse 30, or verse 40 says. To the day. They've been there 40 years on the 430th calendar year day, Moses says. They left. But you got to think about this. 430 years. No direct descendants of Jacob any longer. None of the 12 sons are still there. Not, no, you know, not, not Judah, not Reuben, not, not Gad, not Asher, not, not uh, Benjamin, not, none of them. None of those people are still there. They've been living in a land of multiple idols and gods. They're not even living in the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can you, can you imagine the, they are the people of God still, right? But can you imagine the identity crisis that they had to have been dealing with? Now, we know that they're still telling the stories, right? We know that they're still telling the, the account of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We know that they still know who Joseph is because Moses makes sure to, take, to, to grab his bones, right, as they head out of town. So he takes Joseph's bones so that he can be buried with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the promised land. But you can only imagine how a million people now at this time a million people strong are struggling with this idea that they just got one God when they've been living among a people with at least 10 gods, right? Because that's each one of the plagues is a defeat, a show of God's power over an Egyptian idol or God, little G God. I mean, that, that's what the final plague is, is because the family line of Pharaoh was supposed to be a divine, a, di- a divine line, right? That's the divine right of a king. And so to, to rob Pharaoh of his firstborn means that, means that God was going to take, show who has true divine right, okay? And so I, I just want us to kind of get into our minds that the the people are coming out with, they have this verbal storytelling tradition, right, that they are the people of God, but they have no structure that tells them that they are the people of God. None whatsoever. They've lived in Egypt for 430 years. That's twice as long as America has existed, <laughs> right? I mean, just kind of get your minds wrapped around the, the context, the historical context of that. And so they, they leave Egypt. They, they cross the Red Sea. We read that last week. God waters them when they're thirsty. He feeds them when they're hungry. He's doing everything for them, right? They come to the foot of Mount Sinai, and then God says, this is Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 20, in the first part of our reading, God says, I'm, now I'm, I'm going to come down and visit you. And he, and he says, I'm, my presence is going to cover the mountain. How does God, well, how, how does God show his presence to the, to the people as they're journeying out of Egypt across the Red Sea? What does he provide for them by day and by night? Right, so there's a cloud by day and a Pillar of fire by night, right? And so he uses it to protect them from the Egyptians. He uses it as their guide through uh, on their journey so at this point, to this point. And so now he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover the mountain. How does he cover the mountain? What is the physical evidence of God's presence on the mountain? What did you read? Thunder, lightning, clouds. I mean, it is ominous. And, and God says to the people, what does he tell them how to prepare for this visitation? He says, consecrate yourselves, right? He says, you need to avoid sexual relationships. You need to focus on me. And then he says, don't even come, what? Near the mountain. Now, what what is happening? God is establishing something here, right? And that is that he is holy. 
and he is unapproachable. Because if they were to come up to the mountain and touch it, what does God say is going to happen? You're going to die. What, what, if, what if Fido touches the mountain? He's going to die. And so I'm not like you, God says. I'm not the conjuring up of your imagination. I am God. And so it's in that kind of a context in Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 20, that God begins to make himself known to the people. So here we are. This is the journey that they've been on, right? And so they start off way over here with Abraham. They've made this journey all the way through Haran and Jacob's up here. And then they come and they, Jacob plants his family in the promised land. And then there's a, Joseph makes his way to Egypt and there's a famine in the land. A whole lot of them come here to Egypt. And in the land of Goshen, in this kind of northeast corner of Egypt, they grow to a million people over 430 years. God is fulfilling his promise, right, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. There's a whole bunch of them. Now they've crossed the Red Sea down here. Now they're in this area. This is the Sinai Peninsula down here. And they're around the mountain of God, Mount Horeb. Same place where God appears to Moses in the burning bush, right? The bush that's on fire, but it's not consumed. So it's the same mountain. That's the mountain of God, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Same place. Now, which comes first when God begins to share with him? Exodus chapter 20. Remember, they have no identity. They have no civic structure. They have no government structure. They have no way to operate as a community. Does, the, does God begin this structure with rules or relationship? Or relationship or rules? What comes first? Relationship or rules? This is really, really important. So this is on page 61, if you got your, your book, or this is Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. This is really, really important. Before God gives one rule, he defines the relationship. Notice what he says. I am the Lord, a God. Is that what he says? I am the Lord, the God. That might even be right. But is that what he says? He doesn't say that, does he? He says, say it with me. I am the Lord, your God. You, you wandering people, you, you, you refugees. I am the Lord, your God. So what comes first? Relationship or rules? Relationship. Relationship always comes first. Now, does that mean there are no rules? Absolutely not. Because God, he goes right into it, right? He goes right into it. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods. You shall uh, not make any graven images. You shall, all, all those things begin to happen. So the rules come, but it begins so important, so, so, so important that it, we begin with a relationship. All right. Now the theme of the commandments is love, friends. The theme of the commandments is love. <clears throat> Do you remember back in Christmas during the Advent season, do you remember the verse that we studied all, all the Sundays of Advent? What is the verse that we studied? Every Sunday we talked about it. Children read it to us. John 3, 16. I think my wife said that. Thank you very much, honey. Or my daughter did, somebody. Thank you. So, John three sixteen, And I told you, and I believe this to be true, that you can lay over everything that happens in this world Everything that God does to accomplish his purposes, for God so loved the world, that. And then just, why did God do it? Because he loves us. Why did God give us commandments? Because he loves us. Because he knows what is best. All right? So the structure of the Ten Commandments, the theme here is love. Commandments one through four tell us how to do what? How to love who? God, right. And so, 
No other gods, no graven images. Don't misuse his name and honor the Sabbath, right? Honor the Sabbath. Then five through 10 are commandments that tell us and teach us how to do, love who? Love others or love neighbor, right? Now, does, does that sound familiar to you? Love God, love others? Have you heard somebody else say that's important? Who says that that's important? Jesus does, right? Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. Jesus says, the greatest commandment is this, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like unto it, love your neighbor. And so what, what's happening here is God is showing us what, what this looks like. God is showing us in the commandments that he's a God of order. He's a God of order. That he is the center of attention. Now, if I say I'm the center of attention, that's not good, right? That's not good at all. But if God says he's the center of attention, why is that okay? Because in his perfect, eternal nature, there's no injustice, there's no wrong. Everything that he does is right. And so when God says, I'm the center of attention, he's not saying, la, la, look, la, look at me. What he's saying is, look at me because I am what is best in this universe for you. There's nothing else like me for you. And so he's telling us he is the center of attention. He's telling us that he is sufficient. He's enough. So he tells us six, day, six days of work is enough. You need one day of worship. He tells us family is good. He tells us life is precious. Your marriage is a treasure. Your stuff is enough. The truth is important. And you won't be better off with anybody else's stuff. So stop wanting it. I mean, that's what he says. That's, 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 that's commandments four through 10. I'm sufficient, he says. I'm enough for you. And so over and over again, God is saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm what's best for you in the universe. I love you. And I'm gonna provide for you through your family. I'm gonna provide for you through your material possessions. I'm gonna provide for you everything that you need. I am enough. And so that's what the Ten Commandments are all about. Oftentimes we read the Ten Commandments, we think about the Ten Commandments, and we think guidelines, we think about structure, we think about, you know, um, kill joy, we think about all those things. But the reality is, if we follow the Ten Commandments, it is the best life that you can live on this planet. It is. Absolutely is. Okay. Where are we? The structure of the Ten Commandments mirrors the theme of all scripture. And the theme of all scripture, oopsie, let's do this one. The theme of all scripture is from chaos to order, right? Right, in the beginning, there was chaos. And what does God do? He speaks and things begin to come to order. So what's happening here? What do we have? We have a formless and void people, right? They've been 430 years living as refugees. Now they're out sitting in the middle of the desert. <laughs> they got no structure. They got nothing. It's chaos. And so what does God do? He speaks. And order begins to become their reality. That's what God does, friends. That's the same thing that happens in your life. When you, are, when you become aware of your sin, what did that feel like? When you really became aware of your sin, didn't that feel like chaos to you? I'm not in control. I'm making a mess of everything I'm putting my hands on. And what does God do? He brings order through faith in Jesus Christ. All the old things pass away, behold, everything is new. Friends, I'm telling you, that is the theme of history, God bringing chaos, bringing chaos to order, right? From chaos to to order. And that's what's happening here with the Ten Commandments. God is bringing structure. He is bringing wholeness. He is bringing um, uh, 
order. He is bringing peace. He is bringing his best into their lives. Now, why is God doing that? What does Genesis 12, 3 say again? God says to Abraham, I'm gonna make you into a great nation. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who dishonor you. And through your family, I will do what? Bless all the families of the world. Now, does that mean that you just have to rub up against a Jew and kind of get their mojo off of them? Is that what we're talking about? Does that mean that I should uh, change my citizenship? What does that mean? It means as those people live their lives in a faith relationship, just like Abraham did, right? Just like Abraham did with God, that that faith relationship was going to become a blessing as all the other nations observed this God that is best above all other things. That's where the blessing comes from, is as all the other nations observe these people living in this faith relationship with their God, one God. And so that, that is the source of the blessing. Uh, okay, the covenant is not conditional to the commandments, right? Because what comes first, relationship or rules? Relationship comes first. And so the covenant is not conditional to the commandments, However, uh uh-oh, did I lose one? Where is that? Oh, it's all right there. It's all on one side. However, the commandments are the evidence of the covenant. Do you see the difference there? So in other words, do I have to obey God to get him to love me? Am I I just a, a monkey performing for my master, hoping that he'll give me a treat when I do good? Is that my relationship with God? Well, of course not. Well, then why do I do good? Because he loves me. You see the difference? And that's, that's how God begins his relationship with his people. The covenant's not dependent, not conditional to the commandments, but the commandments, the fulfillment of obedience to the commandments is the evidence of the covenant. That this great God has chosen me And so I will live my life as if there is no other gods. And I will trust him to do what's best for my family and to take care of us. that's, That's a life not to get God to love me, but because God loves me. You see the difference? This means yes, this means no. You see the difference? All right, good deal. Thanks, Lindsay. All right, so... Uh, so here they are, they are at the, the foot of Mount Sinai. God says, I'm holy and you better not come near this mountain because if you come near this mountain, if you touch it, it you're going to like get incinerated. I don't know what was going to happen to him, but it wasn't going to be good. And so <laughs> the funny thing is, so what happens is, is that this whole thing begins to happen. Uh, Exodus 19 verse 8, God tells the people what's going to happen and the people say to Moses, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So we're going to consecrate ourselves. We're going to avoid sexual relationships for the next three days. We're going to get ready, right? And then Moses goes up, Exodus 20 through 24. He gets the Ten Commandments. He comes back down. He's writ- Moses has written them down. But who carves them on the stone? God carves them on the stone. But Moses has written them down. And what he calls in Genesis, Exodus 24, the book of the covenant, right? So he comes down and he reads it to the people. And the people say twice, Exodus 24, 3, Exodus 24, 7. We will do all that the Lord has commanded to us. Moses is like, right on. He heads back up the mountain. This time he's gone for 40 days, 40 nights. Mountains covered with the presence of God. He and God are they're, they're working all this stuff out, right? God is telling Moses how he's going to inhabit or visit the people with his presence in a place called the tabernacle, right? So while Moses is up on the mountain getting the instructions, the people wait patiently for Moses, right? They don't. It's insane. So verse 30, chapter 32, chapter 32, they say to Aaron, right? Brother of Moses, they say to Aaron, up, make us gods 
who shall go before us. As for this Moses, uh, the, the man who brought us up out of Egypt, the land of Egypt, we don't even know what's become of him. As for this Moses guy, we don't even know if he's coming back. So Aaron, you're up, right? And so Aaron's up, and what happens? Aaron says, hey, all right, so bring all the gold that you brought from Egypt. And, uh, and, uh, and his story, Aaron's story to Moses later on is, Moses, I don't know what happened. I thought all these rings and all these earrings and all these stuff, and we all threw it in the pot, and out came a calf, right? I mean, literally, you read it. That's what he says. Out came a calf. I don't know what happened, Moses. The sad, sad thing. Aaron says to the children of Israel, behold your gods who have brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Same thing happens. Fast forward about, um, so right now we're about 12, 1300 BC. So fast forward to about, about 600 years in the future. And um, I guess about 400 years in the future. The southern kingdom and the northern kingdom are splitting apart. And in the northern kingdom in Dan, which is the northernmost kind of boundary of the promised land of Israel, Jeroboam, a illegitimate king, sets up two golden calves and says to the ten tribes of the northern people, behold your gods. Behold your gods. And so the words are like not even off of Moses' lips, right? The people say, we're going to do everything God tells us to do until he's late, right? Until he doesn't operate on my timeline, until he doesn't do what I think he ought to be doing, until it doesn't work out the way that I want it to work out. And in that event, I'm out. And so they're out. And then these crazy things happen. The Levites strap on swords that kill 3,000 people, and then there's a plague, and a bunch more of them die. I mean, it's crazy. Um, crazy things are going on. Now, what happens? God says, what does God tell Moses he's going to do? Genesis, um, Exodus chapter 32. I'm done, right? He says, I'm done. Moses says, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Wait a minute. We are the people of your possession. We are the people of your promise. And we are the people of your purpose. And the Bible says, Moses writes, and God did what? Relented. Wait a second. Pastor, you've been telling us that God never changes. You've been telling us that God can't, if he, if he never changes, that means he can't change his mind, right? But Moses says God relented. He was going to do something, and then he didn't do it. What's happening there, Pastor? I'm not real sure. <laughs> I don't rightly know. Is it that the only words that Moses has to describe what God is doing are the words that we use to describe us changing our mind? Because that's how, what's the terminology Moses has. But it doesn't really accurately fit a God that is eternal and unchanging. It doesn't accurately fit that. But what it does also mean is that God is a God of grace. Did the children of Israel deserve to be wiped out at that moment? Could God have started over with the descendants of Moses, which is what he said he was gonna do, right? Moses, I'll just make you the promised one. I'll just make your kids the promised one. We'll start over. Could God have done that? Could have, except he'd made a promise. He'd made a promise. And they were the people of his possession. And they were the ones through whom he was going to fulfill his purpose, which is his passion for his glory among all peoples. And so I can't, can't completely make sense of everything that happened in those moments. But I will say this. This is probably the best statement that I've ever heard about Genesis 32, Exodus 32, sorry, about what's happening there between God and Moses and this prayer of, of this petition to spare the children of Israel. David Platt says this in his message on, on this passage. He says, God wills to work through willing intercessors. God wills to work through willing intercessors. Did God have a plan? He absolutely had a plan. Did he use the prayer of Moses to accomplish it? He absolutely did because he wills to work through willing 
intercessors. All right. So, the first time Moses comes down, he reads from, to them from the book of the covenant. And in, uh, in Exodus 24, this is on pages 62 and 63 in your, in your books, uh, in, in chapter 5, uh, it says that uh, down at the bottom of the page, ex- uh, he got up early, Moses got up early the next morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half the blood and put it in bowls and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, right? And that's what he's just written down from his encounter with God on Mount Sinai. And, the, and he read it to the people. And the people respond, we'll do everything the Lord's asked us to do. Famous last words. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people. Kind of weird. And said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So question is, why is the covenant established through blood? Why through blood? Represent a sacrifice. Well, why not, why not some wheat or some olives? Why not some olive oil? I'd much rather get sprinkled with olive oil than blood. So what was the deal with blood? Ah, who just said that? Miss Sylvia said that. Thank you, Miss Sylvia. Because the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice represents an unchangeable event, Right? If I, if, I, if I sprinkle you with olive oil, I can just go get some more olives, right? But once that animal is slain, you can't undo that. That's why in Genesis 15, when God reestablishes a covenant with Abraham, Abraham walks through this bull that's been sliced in two. That represents something that cannot be undone. <laughs> you can't get that bull back together again. God is saying, I've made you a promise. It cannot be undone. So the blood sacrifice represents the covenant because again, it's something that cannot be undone. You can't reanimate that sacrifice. You can grow more wheat, you can grow more olives, but you can't reanimate this animal. It's dead. It's given its life for us. So... God establishes his presence with the people by having them build a special tent, right? What's that tent called? The tabernacle. The tabernacle is the place where God is going to inhabit. Now, how does God inhabit the tabernacle? Well, with a cloud, right? What do we call that cloud? Did you read that? The Shekinah glory, right? The Shekinah glory of God. And so whenever the Shekinah glory of God is in the tabernacle and you could visibly see it, then they did what? They just camped out. But when God left the tabernacle, what'd they do? Packed it up and they moved on to what was next. And whenever God came down, they set up the tabernacle for God to inhabit. So, I mean, that's, that's how that worked. But in the tabernacle, there's still sections, Right? So there's a place for, uh, for, for God's people to come and offer sacrifice, but there's a place where they can't go, isn't there? What do we call a place where nobody can go but the high priest? The holy of holies. And so the tabernacle experience established a rhythm of worship through sacrifice and offering for the people. So that's what happens in Exodus 25 to 30, and then, then 33 or so to 40, there's that. And then Leviticus does the same thing. It teaches them this rhythm, this regular rhythm of worship through sacrifice and offering. But then in Leviticus 16, there is the establishing of a special day, one day when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, and with the what? With the blood of a lamb, right? Right? 
and offer atonement for the sin of the people. So it tells us once again that the holiness of God separates him from humans and the only way to reconcile, to repair, to restore, to heal, to bridge, whatever word you want to use, is through what? Blood sacrifice. That is the only way. And so all this, this tabernacle and then later in 1 Kings chapter 5 through 8, a temple, right, where the permanent residence of God among the people in Jerusalem that Solomon builds, is a reminder that God is with the people, but they're separate because he's holy and they're sinful. So they have to trust in this once a year atoning blood sacrifice to atone, to make right for their sin. God is saying over and over to the people, I'm not just up there. I want to be down here with you, right? I want to be down here with you. So here's a regular rhythm of worship through sacrifice and offering. And here's a once a year celebration, acknowledgement, festival, feast, remembrance. When, when, when I'm going to re- receive the blood of a lamb as atonement for your sin. Friends, God still wants to be down here with us. He still wants to be. He, he does that so desperately want to be down here with us that he did what? He sent his only son as a representative of his love to do what? To give his life, to shed his blood as an atonement for our sin. And now I don't have to visit God through a high priest because Jesus has become the high priest and the offering, right? He has become the one offering the sacrifice and the sacrifice. Hebrews 4 tells us we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with us for he was tempted in every way yet was without sin. Friends, if you don't understand this today, know this now, God is not an up there God. He is a down here God. He is a with you God. He is an incarnate Emmanuel, God with us, God. And he is not housed in human constructed edifices any longer. He lives inside of me. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. He lives with us through his sacrifice, through my faith in that sacrifice. And so we read through the the Old Testament stories. Some of them are odd and awkward and difficult to understand at times, but the story, the story is always a pattern of what Jesus will ultimately fulfill in his life on the cross, and that will be the ultimate reality in the new heaven and the new earth. Because ultimately, God promises in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I'm going to establish a new covenant with you. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will dwell among you. And in Revelation 21, what does he tell us? The voice of God comes down from the, from the out of the new heavens and says, I am your God. I am with you for all eternity. And so all of these patterns and things become a reality in Jesus Christ, become my reality today through faith in him. And that is my hope for the future. That one day there'll be no more barriers. It'll be an unmitigated relationship with God for all those who have placed faith in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you see how all these stories point us to him? You see the common thread? One big story about a great big God. Couple of questions. First question, why did Aaron build an altar in front of the calf that he built and announced there would be a festival to the Lord? That is pure syncretism, friends. It is absolute syncretism. It's the same thing that we do when we, uh, when we, uh-oh, got some more, got another one. Um, 
when, when we try to, uh, what it says, was he trying to cover all the bases? In essence, absolutely. What's the problem with that? We don't need to cover all the bases. <laughs> There's one God. That's exactly what he's doing. You know, the, the altar, it, it was just a way to try to appease the God. And so the altar wasn't, the altar was to the calf, not to the Lord of, of, of the people, not, not to the God of Israel. Uh, I've heard some say God never changes his mind, that he already knows. In this passage, it seems he did change uh, his mind. Uh, we, we talked about that a minute ago. I cannot fully explain that, uh, except to say that Malachi chapter 3 says the, the Lord God does not change. He's not like a man that he should change his mind, even it says that. And so um, I think that Moses is using the best terminology that he has to describe what happened there. Um, was, was God, did God have to be convinced of something that he didn't want to do? That's, that's not possible. He's a God of his possession of promise and purpose. But in that moment, he was willing to work through a willing intercessor. And he brought Moses down to intercede for the people, to call upon the promises of God and the purpose of God. And to work through that prayer to save by grace the people of God. Unumas, can you explain the symbolism? Yeah, this is, that was weird. Yeah, so can you explain the symbolism in the burning the calf, grinding it to powder, scattering on the water, and then, then making them drink it? Um, I don't know. Be careful what you ask for, I guess. Uh, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know all, I don't understand all that symbolism, except um, I would think that didn't taste very good. Um, you know, like I said, it's kind of one of those things, be careful what you ask for. Um, God says, you want the calf? I'll give you the calf. Here, drink it. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it just, so that, that's the best that I can do. So can I explain? Probably not to your satisfaction, whoever asked that question. I apologize. Um, but I, I do think it is a, an, an example of, um, you better be careful what you ask for. Ms. Cheryl? Oh, yeah, isn't that a great, that was in our reading, right? Is that, is that Exodus 24, 14, I think, or something like that? I'm the Lord your God. My name is Jealous, right? You should have no other gods. My name is Jealous, for I'm a jealous God. Yeah, great, 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 great. Now, I, I love that. That's beautiful. Yeah, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I, I don't know what, I don't know the, an accurate explanation for that. And so I, I don't want to say that that is necessarily wrong. Moses was certainly uh, disappointed in the behavior of the people. All right, so here we go. Um, I, I didn't read this to you before, but we'll close with our, our little reading of a child's perspective on, on, on the Bible, children's Bible in a nutshell. So here is our story from tonight. Another Bible guy is Moses, whose real name was Charlton Heston. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and away from the evil Pharaoh after God sent ten plagues on Pharaoh's people. These plagues included frogs, mice, lice, bowels, and no cable. God fed the Israelites every day with manicotti. Then he gave them his top ten commandments. These include don't lie, cheat, smoke, dance, or covet your neighbor's stuff. Oh yeah, I just thought of one more. Humor thy father and thy mother. One of Moses' best helpers was Joshua. We're going to stop right there because that's next week. All right, so um, just a little funny. Um, hey, I love you guys, and I, I appreciate you're on the journey. Uh, be sure you invite your friends and neighbors to come with you next week. Invite them back if they're not here tonight. Uh, if tonight's your first night, don't stop coming. Keep on coming. We've got more books. I see a stack of books. Looks like about six books back there. So if you don't have one of these, pick it up. You can catch up easy peasy, lemon squeezy, and, um, and get caught up with our reading. Uh, so next week we'll be in chapter six, The Wandering. All right? So we're not, our reading in Leviticus was that 
italicized portion at the end of chapter 5, and now we're into the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy in chapter 6. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for, God, these beautiful reminders of uh, your love and uh, your provision and your faithfulness to your promise in spite of us. And uh, Lord, we thank you that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, that he is the sacrifice, that he himself is the high priest offering himself on the cross for our sin, that through him we might have fellowship with our God. We thank you for that. Bless us to bless others with that relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, blessings. Blessings, blessings.